Hello, everybody, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you this evening about a trip I did a number of years ago now to the Falkland Islands, to South Georgia and Antarctica. It's a very special trip, and it's one that I think everybody should try and do if you get the chance. It's not cheap, of course. Nothing's cheap when you go down to these sorts of places, but the experiences you're going to get are second to none, frankly, in the world of natural history travel. And this particular trip can go one of two ways. You can either go from uh, up at the very top, which is just off the slide, Puerto Madryn, on the eastern side of Argentina, out to the Falklands and then South Georgia, then down to Antarctica and back up, or to Ushuaia. Or you can actually start and finish in Ushuaia. And actually, mine did start and finish in Ushuaia. Makes no difference. And um, the, the birds are all the same. But it is 19 days, 7,000 kilometers, quite a long way to go. And I did mention, I think I, those of you who saw a talk I gave about remote islands, I did a bit from Ushuaia there. So I'm going to do that again. But it is worth just reminding you that Ushuaia is at the very bottom of the uh, of Argentina, uh, right at the bottom of the Andes. It's a city with just over 40,000 people living there, easy to fly to. And it's where all the ships uh, at that very southern tip of, Antar of, of Argentina set off from. As I said, uh, Puerto Madryn's a little bit further north. Frankly, there's more going on in Ushuaia. That's where I would start my trip from if I had the chance. And part of the reason for that is there's great bird watching nearby. The Andes, as you can see there, coming down to an abrupt halt just above Ushuaia. And you've got uh, great bird watching in those mountains. And I went up there for several days before my trip. I do recommend anything like this you set off ahead of the journey you don't you don't want to be just getting there in time for your ship because all you need is a couple of things go wrong miss a connection or have something horrible like an ash cloud from iceland and you know you, the ship is not going to wait so you need to be there well in advance and there's plenty of birding and my particular target having been there three times was to see the white bellied seed snipe and it does live on these scree slopes above ushuaia not an easy bird to see because it is the same color as the green vegetation or indeed the brown ski scree slope. Uh, but as you can see there, a bit like a grouse or partridge, not really like a wader, although it's known as a seed snipe, which is a strange group of birds only found in South America. And there it is. It's got a white belly, which it doesn't really reveal at all when it's on that sort of habitat because it it would easily show up. But then, of course, when it goes on to any snow, then it's easily visible because of that wonderful feathering. And I love the colours on those feathers. They're almost like pheasant feathers. You get uh, lovely sort of scallop shapes. Well, a great bird to see. It was a real effort, I can tell you. I had to go up wearing snowshoes and had, uh, you know, sticks and goodness knows what. We had to go up as a group because it was quite unsafe. But anyway, that's what I did for the day or so before the the trip and i also had a look around the marshes which are very nice um really good areas just outside the city you just walk from your hotel you've got things like southern lapwing which really looks just like our lapwing with a different colored head really and dolphin gull which is the commonest of the gulls around the coast there quite a sturdy thing with a uh, a dark head at some times of the year they have shoveler there, but this one's a South American species. It's the red shoveler. This is the male. And you've got other ducks nearby, like this um, this bird. This is a flying steamer duck, which is actually rather like an ida in the way that it operates. It's diving down to catch crabs and things like that on the bottom of the sea. But it's not very deep there, so it just goes down about five or six feet or so. There are raptors, like this chamango caracara, which is easily seen very approachable, found quite often on the rubbish tips nearby to um, Ushuaia and uh, operates a bit like a kite does, really, if I'm honest. And this kelp goose, this is the male. The female is very brown and easily camouflaged, but the male doesn't spend any time at the nest, so he can afford to be bright and white and very showy. And then uh, on the coast, you've got blackish oyster catcher, which is the commonest of the South American oyster catchers. There are several. Sounds just like the oyster catcher we have, but it is obviously very different to look at. So anyway, you're you're going to be down there checking out of your hotel the morning of your departure. Your ship will arrive. 
it will come having having been down in the Antarctic will come straight back up and they don't hang about. They're literally only in the harbour there for about four or five hours whilst whilst they get on new food and get the people uh, off. If you look at the back of the ship, you can see all the inflatables, those black things. They're the inflatables that we're going to be whizzing out on to look at uh, wildlife. This is a, a ship called Plantius. It's now um, been around quite a while. It was actually built in 1976 and was in the Royal Dutch Navy. But in 2009, it was strengthened for going into areas with ice. And it was also rebuilt completely and has 116, uh, 53 cabins for 116 people. And it's just the kind of size you want to go on. You don't want to go, uh, you don't want to go on a, a bigger ship than this. Otherwise, you'll spend ages trying to get off. So here we are, we're on the ship, we're actually just getting a briefing, and briefings are a very important part of what we do with this, because when you go on to any of the islands we're going to visit, you, you've got to be very biosecure. They have suffered terribly at the hands of mice and rats, and there have been invasive plants and invasive insects, and they're all created by humans who bring them in. So before you go on any of the islands, you're going to vacuum all your clothes, your boots, um, everything, and you will be inspected before they allow you to leave the ship. That's how important they take it. Anyway, we are actually having a safety drill at this point rather than a vacuuming session. Um, we head off down. Uh, oh, that's a cabin, by the way. There I am uh, in a two berth cabin with a porthole. And if you're thinking about how much money to spend, this is the right level, I would say. It gives you enough space to have all your gear. You don't really want to share that space with uh, three other people. Just one other person's fine. And don't bother to pay extra to have a square window. You're not going to be in your room very much. You won't see anything from it. It's just money down the drain. Anyway, we're going to head off. We cast off around four o'clock or so and uh, have a cup of coffee on the deck, watching as the schwire disappears. And as you're heading off down the Beagle Channel. You've got 240 kilometers to go to get to the very bottom of that channel. It's only about five kilometers wide, so you've got quite a lot of birds close by. These are imperial shags. They nest along the uh, whole length of the, the Beagle Channel, and they're also out on the water feeding in very large numbers. It's the commonest of all the seabirds around Ashwire. Um, so the Beagle Channel, named after HMS Beagle, of course, um, and when you finish going down the Beagle Channel, you'll then spill out into a big area of water, which is known as the Drake Passage. And of course, that's named after Sir Francis Drake. So that's basically between Cape Horn and the Antarctic. But we're not going to go to the Antarctic first. We're going to head out to the Falkland Islands, which is a, a couple of days of sailing, 670 kilometres to cover. And um, you're going to start seeing albatrosses straight away. And this is a black brown albatross rather distantly there. Uh, one of the one of the well, the commonest al albatross you will see on this trip. Um, and we've got giant petrels coming in northern and southern giant petrel. I think that one's a northern one to think about that. Um, they've got a different colored nail on the, the end of the beak. Um, so they're basically refuse collectors. They're around when anybody's either giving birth or dying and anything else in between, really, anything that's opportunistic. The albatrosses, though, are out at sea. You don't see them on land excepting at the places where they're nesting. And this is the black brown albatross, which is the commonest of all the albatrosses in the Southern Oceans. And indeed, it's the only one that I know of that actually is not declining at the moment. As you'll be aware, I'm sure major problems with fishing vessels and long lines and the and the albatross is getting caught up with the bait that's being used and the bait hooks uh, that's something that really is a major major problem still there are larger albatrosses though this is this is the one which we get occasionally off the coast of britain um bempton cliffs i think there's been one for two or three years now and there was one historically for a long long time in the 70s and 80s called albert ross who lived on uh, Herman S in Shetland. But anyway, that's the one we occasionally get. The next size up is the sort of mid-sized albatross, which is in this case, the Southern Royal Albatross. Um, this is a bird that actually nests off New Zealand. It nests on some of the islands between New Zealand and the Antarctic. So it's come an awful long way to reach us in the, on the coasts of Argentina. 
You've also got uh, here white chin petrel with a very dark body, a little tiny speck of white just below the chin. Cape petrel, very distinctive with that wonderful patterning. They're always around the boat, usually the back end, taking advantage of the air currents that are being thrown up as the as the boat goes through the water um, and cuts its way through. And the commonest of all the birds out at sea and indeed anywhere around the whole of the um, Antarctic area is the Wilson's storm petrel. You won't necessarily see a lot of them during the day, but they are there particularly towards the end of the day and indeed in the morning. And quite often you see them on deck as well because they get attracted to the lights. Actually, you do uh, they do cover off all the lights in the in the ship. So otherwise they would have the deck absolutely strewn with um, with seabirds, a bit like moths around a street lamp. So anyway, you've had two days at sea. You're going to start arriving in a place uh, at the very western end of the Falkland Islands. And it could be any island, really. But the one that I particularly like is West Point Island, which is this one. We arrived. It's a bit misty. It looked very much like Scotland when we first arrived. And um, when I got on the island, I suddenly thought I was in either the New Forest or maybe Dartmoor, you know, with those hills and the... Um, room I guess that is we're looking at. So a little bit about the Falklands of course it's a UK territory it is it has a population of 3,000 in total um, it's about five no about three times the size of Hampshire but you know there are the two main islands west and east Falkland and then 776 other islands and 499 of those have not actually been given a name yet so there's a lot of uncharted territory, really, um, and not many people to look around there. So, you know, you can really discover interesting things if you put your mind to it and had the time and the money. Obviously, everyone's had a go at owning Falklands. It's us at the moment, but it's been the French, the Spanish, and of course, the Argentinians um, had a go too. And we claimed it in 1833, and we'll all remember the 1982 Falklands War, which is something you see quite often as you're traveling around. So anyway, here we are, we're walking up through West Point Island and straight away you're finding a few birds. This is a long-toed meadowlark, which is a South American species. Um, and they are very much uh, there singing away. Um, I wonder actually if this bird is going to be split off as a separate species in time, because, you know, this bird will not have been to South America at all. It's its ancestors probably were, well, would have been, but you know, maybe hundreds of years ago. So over time, of course, this is an opportunity for a species to uh, develop itself with a different song from those on the mainland. And the same is true of this one. This is the Austral thrush, but known locally and split by some as the Falkland thrush. Uh, now that's um, widely seen on, on those islands and indeed elsewhere in the Falklands. So again, a South American species. So you're going to walk across the island. It's not a difficult walk particularly, and you're going to head to this place, which is called the Devil's Nose. And um, this is the place where, one of the places where black-browed albatrosses nest. And I'm standing here in a colony of 2,000, um, you know, black-browed albatrosses. And then you look at this photo, you, it looks a bit chaotic, it looks a bit invasive. You know, you think this is, this is very bad tourism. But the truth is that, all the way around where these albatrosses are, there are paths very clearly marked and places where you definitely stop. And each of these people is standing in one of the places where you where you don't go any further. Uh, and therefore, the birds are very used to that. They know nobody goes any nearer and they allow you to get views like this. And here you're looking down into the devil's nose. You're looking at not only black-browed albatrosses, but also the southern rockhopper penguins, which are the... Um, the ones just there in the foreground. I'm going to talk about those in a moment. The black-browed albatrosses, as I say, a couple of thousand pairs. They each have one egg and they incubate that for um, two months. But it then takes the chick another four months to be ready to fly and leave the nest properly. And the male and female take it in turns. And there will be all around the colony odd pairs where they have got back together One's about to take over from the other. And there's some very touching displays between the birds as they do that. And you get the, plant, the chance to look close up at um, the eye and you realise why it's called the black-browed albatross, because it's got this lovely 
smudge going through the eye, which is beautiful. Here's a bird just stretching a little bit and standing up and it's revealing the egg underneath. And you can see the mud nest they have. They make these mud um, cups, which are, are many, many, many years old. And they're used year after year, usually by the same birds. Although, of course, occasionally there will be a takeover. And here's a bird just sitting there for days on end. They can't leave to go and feed. They can only feed every couple of weeks when their partner actually comes back. And there is one either just arriving or leaving. It's got quite a big wingspan, of course, but nothing like as big as some of the some of the, the birds we're going to see, some of the albatrosses later on, particularly in South Georgia. And this is that penguin. This is the southern rockhopper penguin. Quite a character, very loud, boisterous, always watching these. You've, you've got lots of activity. They nest in little hollows that they make. And there's a hell of a lot of argument going on between them. There's never a quiet moment on a colony of southern rockhoppers. These are vulnerable species. There's only 400 in this particular colony, uh, but it's you know it's a bird that's declining, and it's been suggested that climate change is driving that because they have to go further now in order to get the fish that they need to feed. But it's a super looking bird. It's got a very interesting uh, breeding strategy. So they have two eggs one big egg and one small egg and the small egg is not designed to be hatched it's designed to be given as a gift to say a brown skewer that's going to come along and, and and demand something so it's a bit like having two watches an expensive one and a cheap one and then when somebody holds you up in on the street you just give them the cheap one as a as a gift so that's a good strategy so they very rarely ever hatch out the second egg it's just a, a little bribe for thugs and there's the typical sort of raucous donkey-like noise coming out of a, a southern rock copper penguin. That afternoon, you'll then move on to a second place. And on this occasion, we went to Carcass Island. I was absolutely appalled by the amount of junk and rubbish on the, the shore there. You know, we're so far from anywhere, and yet there's all this stuff, which is terrible. But on the island, the bird watching is superb. And here we've got another oyster catcher. This is the Magellanic oyster catcher. And uh, it looks to me pretty much like an oyster catcher you might see uh, down at Western Shore. But when you look at the eye, it's a very yellow eye, much more than the R's have a sort of um, pinky blue eye, if I remember rightly. Pinky, I think. Um, and the legs are very pale pink too. Um, there's also another steamer duck. This is uh, the one here, it's the Falkland steamer duck. It's endemic to the Falklands. And the crucial thing about this one is it can't fly. Just see there, it's got no flight feathers at all. It's just got stubby wingtips. And they don't need to fly because there's nowhere to go, really. It's just the Falklands and that's it. So they just um, are there um, and they don't go anywhere else. That's why they're endemic. Another endemic is the Cobb's wren which is actually a form of a house wren, southern house wren from South America. But I think it's going to be, well, I think it is split formally by some people. Um, and it should be really, because it's not been anywhere near South America in centuries. Uh, there's also this one, it's the blackish synclodes, which is another South American bird known locally as the tussock bird. It spends its time in all the tussock grass, which could be short or long, particularly prefers the short tussock grass for finding insects. And everywhere you go, there is this tussock grass. Here we are looking at it. Um, you can wander around on the Falklands. You don't uh, you don't get sort of um, too many places where you're told you can't walk. Common sense at the end of the day is the, the word. Um, when you look around, you're going to see penguins in a colony. You shouldn't go too close. This lady is about as far forward as you should go if you're going to look at penguins. And indeed, indeed, if you go too far, you're going to probably bump into an upland goose and they are way more aggressive than penguins. This is a female and they defend their territories very, very fiercely indeed. Um, but the penguins are terrific. This is the Magellanic penguin, which is very similar to the penguin you might have seen in South Africa if you've been down there just outside of Cape Town. And uh, they are quite timid, actually. They go down to the water in groups they never go alone and uh, you know there are seals that will attack them leopard seals for example and um, when they 
when they come back out, they sometimes come back out with bigger penguins like these Gen 2 penguins, which I think are really attractive. I have to say they're probably my favourite amongst all of them. And there is the Gen 2, quite a tubby penguin with a with a red beak. And I like the little bit of white, the little flecks of white and the black head. So there's a colony of Gen 2s. Again, quite noisy. They are nesting together in the open there. And uh, they have two eggs as well, but they do actually hatch out both of their eggs. So it's a different strategy to the rock. Uh, and they are um, they are there on. Uh, I was there on a really hot day. So I don't know if you've ever wondered how penguins sleep. Well, the truth is a lot of them sleep standing up. But if you've got a nest, uh, then the best thing is just simply to crash out. So there's a penguin, Gen 2 penguin on a hot day, crashed out. Looks like it's been down to the pub, uh, but in fact, it's just simply incubating a nest. Uh, <laughs> terrific photo. Love that. But they have to be careful because there is this bird too. This is the striated caracara, which is a, a near threatened raptor. It's only found in the Falkland Islands. Nicknamed locally Johnny Rook. Don't know where that name came from, but they are alongside the brown skewer, the main predator of these penguins on land, taking their eggs, taking their chicks if they can as well. And here's the brown skewer, which is very closely related to our own great skewer. It's not quite as aggressive looking, but it is pretty aggressive compared to uh, the caracara, that's for sure. And there are smaller birds too. This is the white bridal finch, which is easily seen. And that is a bird that you can see in South America as well, but I never got anywhere near to them in South America. They're always way 100 meters away or something so really pleased to get shots like this anyway you finish off there get back on the boat uh nice dinner go to sleep and you'll wake up opposite stanley so stanley of course is the main capital of the falklands two thousand of the three thousand people of the falklands live there and um it is a place that is stuck in time really you know it doesn't feel like it's in this century even it feels actually to be honest like it's back in 1982 when the Falklands War was happening and and indeed everything around the place is reminding you of the war the challenge of that the fact that Margaret Thatcher supported them very strongly in 82 and even when you're looking at you know signs about the wildlife you're looking at places that are very clearly related to the war and the British success there. Now, there, there were some amazing um, areas for birding which were covered in uh, landmines and they were out of bounds to us. These are now actually open once again. The, the, the signs have been taken down, the mines have been removed. Well, there aren't many people there, so I'm sure they're just as wonderful as they were then. But the thing is that nobody was going on these beaches and so the, the wildlife just had the place to themselves. And you had things like this rufous chested plover, which was very easy to see and very confiding. A bird I've seen in South America, but never got anywhere near to. And also this, the two banded plover, which again is a commonish wader in, in Argentina, but not happy to have you anywhere near it, unless of course you're on the Falklands and then it's very easily approachable. Um, I organised that as a little side trip. That's not something that the cruise ship did, but uh, didn't cost me much. I just got a taxi in Stanley, got back into Stanley, had about an hour or so doing some shopping, bought the obligatory postcard, and uh, and then headed back onto the ship. But then it's three days of being at sea, 1,500 kilometres we've got across to get to um, South Georgia. which is a great opportunity to go sea watching. Truth is, though, you're not going to see many birds actually once you've got more than 100 you know, kilometers from the coast because, you know, the seabirds are nesting on the coast and they don't want to be way, way out at sea. So the only things you're going to get out really way out at sea are, are the larger uh, albatrosses. But when you're close to the coast, you've got prions. Now, prions are like tiny versions of fulmers. These are Antarctic prions, which are the commonest ones around there. And they are there in their hundreds flying around behind the boat. There are about five species of prion and you generally know which one it is, but you quite often have to choose between two species. So the best way is really just to take loads of photos 
and then really look at the photos closely because the beak shape, the size of the beak and the shape of the beak are the key things to look for. Grey-headed albatross, really beautiful bird, closely related to the black-browed albatross and, and the same size as well, but got that greyish tinge to the head. But the one that everybody wants to see, and it really is, you know, the, the ship almost rocks as everybody rushes from one side to the other to see it, is the wandering albatross, which comes through um, not every every hour, probably see one every three or third or fourth hour. They're not common at all. It is the largest flying bird in the world. Uh, that's a record it shares with Andean condor, but frankly, the albatross should have it because in any year, uh, they fly something like 180,000 kilometers. It's just a stunning bird. And we're going to see those again in a minute because they're actually breeding on South Georgia. Back to the small albatrosses. This is the light-mantled sooty albatross, which actually spends a lot of its time alongside the ship, just skimming the waters like a shearwater and, and picking up small things as it goes that might have written, risen to the surface, maybe from the, the churning of the propeller. Well, eventually you get there. You get to South Georgia, which is um, just a, an amazing place. I mean, I think, you know, it's definitely in the top five places I've ever been to. Um, way, way better than, for example, Antarctica or the Falklands, just for the, the birds and the scenery and, and just the scale of it. I mean, it's the same size as Hampshire, um, but it goes up to nearly 3,000 metres. So it's a very, very high place in one or two locations uh, not always though only 20 people live there they all work for the british government and they mostly work in the post office or in tourism or, or things like that there are no trees but they have most of the world's largest penguin colonies and that's what we're we're really hoping to see and the first place you're going to end up at if you're lucky is salisbury plain and Nothing had actually prepared me for this. I'd obviously seen king penguins in the zoo as a, as a child, but I'd never seen king penguin in the wild. And as I stood on the deck of the ship looking out, I saw this this sight. I mean, I knew they'd be on the beach, but I hadn't really you know, got to my, my head around the fact that they'd also be up the side of the hills as well. So you can see there those penguins all the way up the side of the hill, thousands and thousands of them. Uh, in fact, 100,000 pairs, so 200,000 adults and probably about 100,000 chicks. So 300,000 penguins. So having never seen one and then going to seeing 300,000 in one go, I've never done that with any bird before. I'm sure I'll never do that again because it's just the, the, the scene that you cannot really imagine. Uh, and this is just a tiny, tiny proportion of the entire colony. How they find each other is always a bit of a mystery to me but it's vocally done uh, the calls are distinctive enough that they can tell each other apart the thing that worries me is bird flu and we know bird flu now has reached south georgia and if bird flu did go through a colony like this then i really dread to think what the impact would be it would be immense um, i guess they'd get through it but it would be a very very bad time they're not always just in crammed in. Here are a couple um, who are just meeting up and displaying with each other for um, the first time maybe in, in a while because they, they clearly wanted to be away from all the others. And you get an opportunity to see what they look like uh, close up, this wonderful waxy orange on the beak and down the throat with the, the lovely orange and the black there and the outline of the yellow with the gray, super looking thing especially on the back when you see this demarcation between the grey and the orange with the black line. Looking at them closely, you can see just how many feathers they have got packed in, even though they can't fly. They've got so many feathers and, of course, a very, very thick layer of blubber, which allows them to go not only deep into the water, but into very cold water indeed. And feet that allow them to climb up those rather slippery face uh, muddy faces you can see that the they've got three toes at the front and then the fourth toe which on a normal perching bird would be right at the back in the penguin is slightly side on which just helps to give them a bit more grip as they're going up those slippery slopes 
It's not only the adults, these are young birds here. This is um, a, a plumage they'll have for about a year before shedding that and then having the, the white feathers coming through. And you can see there the ear of the chick on the side of the head. And you've got uh, the chicks mainly around the edge of the colony. And in the middle, you've got all the adults with younger chicks. So there is at any stage, you know, quite a few stages, there'd be very small chicks, big chicks, and also adults. And as I say, they stay around the edge because that's where the parents can go and feed them when they need to find them. The, uh, the next day, you'll have another look at penguins. You'll go to St. Andrew's Bay. And this actually has more penguins. It has 150,000 pairs. So, you know, in total, it's going to be about 400,000 penguins. Not only that, you've got a lot of seals here. You can see the southern elephant seal, which is a huge animal. Um, there, there's a welcoming party. You get birds that watch you as you arrive, and um, you're not allowed to touch them, of course. You just have to walk around them. But, you know, I just sat down. What I did was I just put myself down and sat for about 20 minutes and just took everything in, and they walked around me probably thought I was some sort of new seal that they hadn't seen before. Um, there they are. Wonderful, wonderful birds. Now, you probably know some of you, Steve Smith. He was on the trip. Steve used to be in Southampton. There's Steve. He's got absolutely no idea that it's penguins eyeing him up from behind. He's now down in Dorset, of course. I think he used to be IBM, wasn't he, I think, in Southampton. So there's, these are baby elephant seals. Uh, the southern elephant seals. You can see the parents in the background, but these are the young babies who were rather attracted to the nice soft sheeting that we put down to put all our equipment on to keep it from getting covered in sand. And uh, they decided that they weren't going to have us put our cameras on those. They were going to lie on them instead. So we constant battle, sort of pushing them off, and then they come back on again. But what an appealing animal and you know when you think back to how many of these were slaughtered a hundred years ago it's just appalling really they are they are you don't have to kill many elephant seals to get a lot of blubber they weigh three thousand kilos the adults and they're five meters long but the one that was nearly made extinct was this the antarctic fur seal i mean you know there were so many of them were killed that they were almost extinct this is a young one a very playful young one. I was photographing uh, penguins, but this one came up and followed me around. And the thing you've got to remember when you're on a place like this is you've got to have eyes in the back of your head because you're photographing a seal, but the parent could be right behind you, perhaps with two other parents, one on the left, one on the right, and you're going to be surrounded. And, you know, quite a few people get caught off, caught out, and, and indeed attacked. Just the week before, a man got bitten in the hand by an Antarctic fur seal, and he had to be taken to a hospital. And if you can imagine, in South Georgia, it's too far for an aircraft to arrive from anywhere. You can't get a helicopter there from from the Falklands, for example. Uh, the only thing you can do is get on a cruise ship oh, and be going the other way. Uh, and if you're lucky, it might be going towards the Falklands, which is a three-day sail. But if you get bitten by a fur seal, you're going to die from the bacteria that your hand will be affected by. So I'm watching this lovely pup, and then behind me, there's this rather less attractive female uh, bearing her teeth. So you've just got to be aware. You also get the chance to do some really nice little sailing trips to small coves like this, Gottal Bay, and you can just see in the back the background there on the, the back of the picture, one of the inflatables. We're all out in inflatables just enjoying what we can see, which will include shags. This is the South Georgia shag, which is only found there. Very approachable, never really sees people, so doesn't think of them as being anything other than something to ignore. A lot of terns. Um, Arctic terns, for example, which are down there because they're there for the British winter. I was there in November. Um, but also this one, very similar looking, but it's actually the Antarctic tern. And this one has a white piece just above the beak. These breed here, and they are breeding at the time when I was there, and they spend their winter, in other words, our summer, in, um, uh, in South Africa, on the coast of South Africa and Namibia. 
and uh, whichever the other one was, I'm sorry, I can't remember now. I think this is the northern giant petrel. Anyway, it's got a pink beak, pink tip to the beak, where the other one had a yellow tip. And um, they're there looking around as well in case anything's died. It's about this time when you start to see icebergs, and there are not huge numbers, but they are big. And you've got to be, you know, the ship have to be very aware of them because 90% of the iceberg is not visible and it's below the water. So um, you have to be careful there. One of the essential things really is to go and see Gritvik, and it's the place where the tourism centre is and it's where Shackleton is also buried. But it's a grisly reminder of what we used to do. You know, we owned South Georgia and yet we allowed uh, whaling to go on there. Uh, from 1904 to 1966, 175,000 whales were hauled into Grit Bicken by ships like this, the Petrel, a whaling ship. And that included 41,000 blue whales. And you can see the harpoon gun there on the front of the, the ship. Even back then, you know, a blue whale in the early days was worth £2,000 in the, in the early 1900s. Incredible. So anyway, that's a, a bit of a museum to how awful we were. And when you're there in Gritvik and you can see on the right hand side, those huge tanks, they contained all the blubber from the whales and also from the seals that were killed and penguins. And it's a time to remember, remember you know, Ernest Shackleton, he died age 47. He was an amazing, you know, explorer, probably a very difficult person, I imagine, to, to be with, but an inspiring person all the same. And he actually took his men across um, in uh, South Georgia in May 1916. So in May, May 1916 would have been in winter. And they did it from one side to the other, the, the narrow point, in 36 hours in 1916. So in about 2016, 100 years on, the British Army decided to see how long it would take them. And it took them the same amount of time. So it just shows what Shackleton's men achieved back then. It's traditional to have a tot of whiskey by Shackleton's grave, uh, but not to drink much of it and to actually put most of it on his grave. Plenty of birds around the bay there. This is a, um, a yellow-billed pintail, but it's actually the local South Georgia race. So that is known as the South Georgia pintail. And so that's a nice bird to see. I love the color of the water there actually i wasn't really planning on that but i really just think that's lovely colors another bird that was particularly on my list to see was this the south georgia pipit which is near threatened um it really almost went extinct a few years ago about 10 years ago they'd almost got down to the lowest they could and that's because of rodents on south georgia and there were just so many rats and mice that had got there from various shipwrecks over the years and probably from the whaling ships as well. But in 2018, the good news is that the British government was able to declare South Georgia rat free, having put poison baits down in uh, the whole of the island. Um, and as I say, it's the same size as Hampshire. So they had to literally take three helicopters and fly bucket loads of rat poison and drop these from uh, from, you know, the, the helicopter all the way around the island very systematically doing transects. And I mentioned you can't get a helicopter down there, so they had to actually take the helicopters on a ship and they had to build them in South Georgia when they arrived. On the northeast side, there's Drygalski Field, which is a very spectacular place. And here you've got this wonderful glacier coming down through the field coming down to the water's edge. And the whole time, of course, as with all glaciers, it's, it, you know, you've got uh, bits breaking off. It's just a stunning place. That's, you know, the look at the clouds in the mountains there, look at the sky and the way the light is refracted with the, the top of the, the cliff. And then down at water level, you've got these Wilson storm petrels and some seals as well, all feeding on plankton and stuff that's coming up to the surface because you've got the 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 huge chunks of ice falling into the water and that in turn is is churning up everything that's going on beneath that there is another penguin and this is the macaroni penguin and it's 
actually the commonest penguin in South Georgia, which takes some doing because when you've seen all those king penguins and you realize there's you know, going to be over a million of those, uh, well, there are even more macaroni penguins. And they nest not only on the open scree there, but they also nest in the tussock grass as well. And there are just loads and loads of them. But you can't get anywhere near them, really, because there are way too many seals around. And if you tried to photograph them, you'd probably get attacked. But here they are, quite similar to the southern rock copper, a bit fatter. Um, oh, I've just realized there's a um, sheath bill also walking up there in the, on the right. Um, oh, you'll see that later. There's one molting macaroni penguin um i did actually find one right around the other side of the world i went to macquarie island off um well sort of getting on for a thousand miles south of um new zealand and um it was completely in the wrong place uh, in amongst a colony of royal penguins and it was the third record for australia anyway um that's the macaroni penguin then molting and here we are in our inflatables we're looking around for what there is we don't normally go around in a gang like that but on that occasion we did have a leopard seal so we're all keeping an eye out for that so it's a bit of a sort of twitch uh, of, of a leopard seal there's also prion island which is a place that's closed from the 20th of november to the 7th of january and, and it's a very special island because it is the nesting place for the wandering albatross and there's just one there in the foreground which you can just see and there it is there's the female so she's got very, very white snowy plumage that's quite often known as the snowy albatross. There are four races of wandering albatross. Um, for example, Tristan albatross, which is found further north. Uh, but they're all they're all currently considered as wandering albatrosses. But I think it's only a matter of time before people do chop them up properly and say these are separate species. Um, it's an amazing bird. As I said, it's, you know, over 150,000 kilometers a year flown, uh, you know, and they they don't breed until they're at least 10 years old. So there's a hell of a lot of investment in terms of time and energy into getting a bird from being a, from an egg uh, to being an adult. And uh, and then when you find out that so many get killed by these longline fisheries, it's just a disaster. They incubate the eggs for three months. They then have to wait another six months for the chick to be big enough to fly. And of course, almost all the year is taken up with that. So wandering albatrosses do not nest every year. They nest in alternate years because it's just such a big effort all around and they need a year out to recover and get back into good condition because, of course, these birds have to spend weeks on end at the nest unable to feed. So it does leave them weak and very, very underweight. There's the male flying around above the colony, keeping an eye on us and keeping an eye on his female. And here he is coming into land. He was about to do a, a uh, session for a few days at the nest whilst she went off around the Antarctic. So we are going to go to the Antarctic now, and it's a very exciting point of the trip. Um, I have to say Antarctica for me was a little bit less impressive than some of the other places. You're not going to see as many birds. You're going to see amazing scenery. And of course, you'll tick off a new continent. Um, but nothing really prepares you for the scale of it. So a few facts. It's twice the size of Australia. 99.6% of, Antarct of Antarctica is actually ice. And the average thickness of the ice is two kilometers. So there's an awful lot of water caught up in Antarctica. In fact, 70% of the world's fresh water is tied up in Antarctica. It is, of course, the coldest continent, no surprise there, but it's also the driest continent with only 200 millimeters of rain. And it's got the lowest temperature in the world. You won't probably experience anything much colder than a really cold day in, in Europe, but it has reached minus 89 degrees centigrade. So it, you know, it is dangerous if you get stuck. Birds are familiar. We've got the Cape Petrel again, the black and white one, but we've got some fulmers now. And in this case, it's the southern fulmer with the pink beak, very similar to our own fulmer we might see of going around the Isle of Wight. And we've also got other birds like this snowy sheathbill, which I pointed out just now. It's a bit like a pigeon, 
It hangs around penguin colonies and feeds on things that have died. Um, and of course, if seals are giving birth, then it will pick up the afterbirth as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, you see some amazing structure of, of ice. I mean, how does a piece of ice like that get created? <laughs> you know, obviously broke off tens of years, maybe hundreds of years, and is quietly, gently melting. So the first people to see scenes like this were the Russians in 1820. And then in 1895, the first people to land on Antarctica were the Norwegians. And since then, we have taken good care, I think, of Antarctica. Uh, in 1959, the Antarctic Treaty was created. Twelve countries signed that. And a further 38 countries have now joined in with that. So there are no military activities and mining is banned. Tourism arrived in 1966. And I don't know how many tourists there are now because it took a huge dive during the, the COVID year and the year after. But, you know, it was something in the region of 40 to 50,000 people a year. And although you might think that's bad, I have to say I never saw anything from the tourists other than people caring about the environment a tiny part of the place is touched by humans and they go to the same places over and over again. So you know, it's not like the new forest where, you know, people can go anywhere. You actually are told where you can go and uh, you can't go anywhere else. I've never seen scenery like it. I mean, you know, huge, great rocks coming out of the sea up to an amazing height, just just incredible. I mean, you know, you see things like that through on, on, on movies, you know, and it's all kind of made up, but that's real. That really is real. And uh, quite a challenge taking photographs because it is so bright. So ice is being formed all the time um, and, and bits of ice are falling off. Here's a huge, huge piece of ice that fell off many, many years ago. So you've got great big islands of ice floating around like this. Um, some of them bigger than this, of course. And with climate change, that's happening more and more. But these have their own climate. So, for example, as we got close to this, the temperature went down by about 12 degrees. It was very noticeable. And some of the ice, I mean, it's four billion years old, some of it. It's been there the whole time since the Earth uh, cooled. And um, everywhere you're going, you're seeing icebergs that are various stages of toppling over. Uh, and disappearing and the piece in the background there as well and everywhere also you've got whales <clears throat> it's the best place to see whales i've had about 180 whales around the ship on one occasion um, this is humpback whale and um, if you're good on your whale uh, observation you'll realize that this is two whales the one at the back on the left is actually already diving and its tail is just the part that's visible it's already gone down and the one on the right is still on the surface and just blowing. And there are penguins on the ice as you go past. So if you look down from your, your cabin or from the side of the deck, you'll see penguins running around. A good time to see them. We stop at various places. So here's um, Deception Island, which is an active volcano. Sometimes you can't go on the island because it is too active. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful about um, where you go, just in case it does erupt. The island itself, the first sort of meter of land on the island is really hot, uh, and the water a meter in is cold. But the bit in between is quite pleasant, so you can actually go paddling. Uh, but it is a bit like a sort of bath. You know, you're not quite sure what the temperature is going to be like, so you, people do get burned. Used to be a whaling station as well, sadly. It's always a reminder of what went on before. There are different penguins here. I mean, you've got some Gen 2s, but this is the chinstrap penguin. I have to say that's a really appealing penguin, isn't it? it looks like it's got a cycle cap on with a sort of little strap under the, under the chin. And um, they are wonderful. They also have two eggs and they hatch both of those as well, just like the Gen 2 does. And they scramble up those cliffs with those feet and those claws. They're very good at doing that. And they also have very, very uncomfortable nests, just a load of rock, which they settle down on. I only saw one, a daily penguin. Um, sometimes you do see them, sometimes you don't. I was lucky, just got the one. But 
back to the Gen 2 penguin, which we've seen before. Uh, as I said before, they have two, two eggs and they hatch both of them. And there's constant arguments between different Gen 2 penguins about who's stole, stolen rocks from whose nest, and it's just never ending. And every day they head down to the sea to do two things. First of all, they obviously want to catch fish, but they also want to have a drink and they drink fresh water from the melting ice on the, the icebergs and the bits of ice that are, or the snow that are there. And uh, they just very often will be underneath drinking the melting water. Here they are coming down or going back up, having having gone down very quickly, they toboggan all the way down that little channel, which I imagine was good fun. And then the horrible kind of climb back up to the top. We've got another um, skewer. This is the South Polar skewer, a little bit smaller than the brown skewer, but with lots of brown skewers around. And, and all the time, of course, these, these penguins are being very careful not to be predated. And they're also a little bit cautious of this, the the snowy sheath bill. I've never seen a sheath bill take a take a chick, but I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't put it past it. Whilst I was photographing this, I also saw what I thought was going to be another one, but actually no, it was a snow petrel, and that's a really fabulous bird. This is one of three species that nest near to the South Pole, and so this this bird was a just a wonderful thing to see, like a dove flying through. I only saw it once. Well, we're sailing amongst these incredible um, blocks of, of ice and snow. We are just dwarfed by all of that. And uh, it's such a special opportunity to go out in the Zodiac and just quietly sail around looking at the ice and uh, noticing the shapes, the colour of the ice, the older the ice, the bluer it is. And, um, and looking at the shapes in the side of the ice where the they because they freeze up every evening and they melt a bit every every day during the daytime and there and there is an example of it in the daytime just you know melting a bit which is where the penguins go in order to drink if you take photographs you will take a lot of photographs so you need plenty of memory on your on your cards a few mammals i didn't really spend a lot of time looking at mammals but this is a weddell seal which is um not particularly aggressive, spend most of its time sleeping, frankly. I kept about finding Weddell seals sleeping. And you've got to be a bit careful you don't bump into this one. This is the leopard seal, which would happily eat you as much as it would eat a penguin. And also this one, the crab eater seal, which always seems to have this kind of smile on its face. They don't eat crabs. Don't know where that name came from. Uh, but uh, they're rather good. And we're, we're on deck a lot of the time looking for whales. Here, for example, we're on the front and we're thinking we might see some whales. And yeah, here we go. Humpback whale right underneath us. They breed in the tropics, but they come here as well at other times. And they're individually recognizable from the barnacles that grow on their um, on their on their front end and indeed on their tails. When you look at the tails, they've each got individual markings and scratches, which the scientists on the ship were able to identify individual animals from previous years and orcas as well plenty of them these are from the ship and sailing past and i had no idea how big they were because i was on the shore one day photographing penguins and you probably have seen in one of the attenborough programs when an orca tries to grab a penguin off the beach well one came right up and tried to grab a penguin as i was standing next to it and it did make me think that that was probably a moment when I could have been at risk because, you know, I'm sure it would be just as happy to eat me. The thing was massive. Absolutely. I couldn't even get a photograph of it properly. So the ship is there. We are out walking around. I'm actually on Antarctica now for the very first time. I managed to um, walk out and there's a little flag in the ground, uh, which is not actually me declaring my ownership of Antarctica. Uh, it's just actually a little little red sign to say, don't go any further. This is the point at which you stop. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, hope for some of you that might have brought back memories if you've been. If you haven't been, then that might be the point at which you decided it would be a trip you'd like to do. 
but I'm very happy to answer any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand back to you, Mike. Okay, thanks uh, very much indeed. Um, fantastic photographs that really brought uh, the whole thing alive for us. Thank you. Uh, if um, whilst people are thinking about possible questions and so on, if I can kick off with um, one. I mean, you mentioned biosecurity and you mentioned about the eradication of rats on South Georgia. Um, I suspect many of us have seen you know, the, the images from Gough Island before they did the eradication there of the albatrosses, adult albatrosses indeed, being predated by mice. Um, was, did it, was, was there any thought that South Georgia might have got into that same similar sort of difficulty? Uh, so in South Georgia, I don't know what the situation was before. They didn't have anything like as many albatrosses as Gough Island. Um, they just have a few, and they're mainly on places like uh, like the small islands. Um, I mean, I, th I don't think they ever had the problem to the degree they had. They mainly had the problem with smaller birds. So things like, for example, the South Georgia pipit was getting exterminated by rats. And it was an endemic bird, which is why they, they dealt with it. The Gough Island story, I can't remember if I've given you my talk on remote islands of the world, uh, but I, I have been to Gough Island and also Tristan da Cunha. And I actually think, um, you know, that story is fascinating. The RSPB went out to Gough Island in 2019 after quite a lot of lobbying. I mean, I used to be on the RSPB board uh, in the early 2000s and we were talking about this and they were very kind of like should we do it should we not and I said well you know if Gough Island was off Shetland you'd be dealing with this it's a British territory just go and deal with it and the way to deal with it is to go to the British government and say look we've got a million quid to sort this out but it needs two million quid so you put up a million and we'll put up the other million and I think in the end that's what they did anyway they got there in 2019 and then COVID arrived and they got taken away and uh, they did eventually though get rid of all the rats but then sadly they didn't get rid of them all and what they found in Gough Island is that the rats are only a problem when they're at plague proportions so naturally the rats would eat seeds uh, but when they are in plague proportions they start attacking the albatrosses so as long as you can keep the numbers down you don't have to eradicate them you just have to go back and knock, knock them on the head every few years. So I don't know if that's answered your question, Ray. It's a bit of a roundabout way of answering. There's a few questions, I think, in the chat. Shall I just have a quick look at those? Uh, I think most of them are about um, conversations about we were having, trying to get the oh, right. streaming working for one or two people. Interesting. That is odd. Okay, well, sorry about that. Not yeah, my no, end, as far as I know. I don't think it's your end or our end. I think um, uh, one or two people were um, were getting a bit out of sync. But hopefully when I put the video up in uh, a day or two onto our YouTube channel, yeah. it will be perfectly in sync there. And if anyone's missed any of your excellent photographs, they'll be able to catch up again. Yeah. So I took all the photographs uh, in this talk. And um, as I think some of you know, I use a bridge camera. I don't use a long lens. So I'm using a bridge camera which will go up to uh 1400 millimeters as it were um although i never use it at that length um but you know 500 pound bridge camera um which has been my choice for the last 10 years um, i use a canon sx 70 at these days which i've had for about uh, five years now i think i think from memory you're somewhere north of eight and a half thousand species I am. I'm on about 8,760. So, so. Uh, on your trip south there, how many were new for you on that on that trip? Well, when you include um, all of the places, probably only something like, for me, probably about 25. Because, uh, you know, it would be penguins, probably not even 25, maybe 20. Um, the trip where you get a lot of um, good birds is if you go, for example, on um, the subantarctic trip from New Zealand, because you're taking in a lot of islands with New Zealand uh, species. Um, yeah, it's about 20. So you don't go for big numbers of species. You go for big numbers of individual birds and scenery, 
and spectacles that you won't see anywhere else in the world. And I've been very lucky. I've been twice. Mm. Any questions from anyone else? I want to hold this. I do have a, another one up my sleeve, just in case. The reason why I went twice, by the way, is not because I'm hugely wealthy. Um, but what I didn't tell you is that when we were in South Georgia, a lady fell and broke her hip. She was 82 years old, and she was getting back on the ship after one of those nice little cruises. And we had to turn back, and we turned back to the Falklands to drop her off, which was three days at sea. And then, of course, we had to then get to Antarctica. We had to abandon the rest of the South Georgia trip, and we just went straight down to Antarctica at full speed with uh, all three engines running. Uh, they normally only use two. And so, um, yeah, a uh, bit of a blow. I, I've never seen quite so many people crying. Um, <laughs> and the doctor was having to deal with her and her broken hip, and he was also having to deal with about 50 people who needed antidepressants and goodness knows what. <laughs> I just, you know, I just thought, well, it's very sad, but, you know, things happen like that. Anyway, they were very good. They said, you will have, uh, we'll give you a 40% discount off another trip. And I thought, well, I want to do it again. So I'll have 40% off. Perfect. Um, so yeah. a, a related question on that. Um, did you get seasick? It's no, didn't get seasick at all. <laughs> <laughs> I had patches, I had a little patch on the back of the neck, like Steve Smith had. And uh, it's a drug which goes into your body. Um, and you end up with eyeballs, your eye, you know, your eyes are pupils that are sort of really dilated. You look like you're on drugs. Well, you are on drugs. So it, <laughs> but you do look like you're on the wrong kind of drugs. And um, uh, I never became sick at all. I actually uh, was fine. But I do know some people were ill. And there were a couple of scary moments. You know, we came back across the Drake Passage and, you know, the ship was rocking from side to side and they had to put a huge, great rope down the middle of the bar because you couldn't get from one side of the bar to the other without falling over. So you sort of stop halfway and grab hold of a rope. Phil, I think you had a question, didn't you? Yeah, just wondering what the bird diversity in Falklands is, how many species there are there. It's a matter of interest. It's about the same latitude as us, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so round. So, so just for comparison, it's an island, I suppose. How many species? You've probably in total got you haven't got much actually. You've probably got about fifty or so species you'll see. Yeah. Not many. It's quite remote, isn't it? That's the it is. So all the yeah. all of the uh all the passerines are birds that have got there from South America at some point and stayed. Um, there were many more non passerines, you know, ducks and uh, mm. waders and things like that, and birds of prey and so on. You know, I didn't realize there'd be so many passerines because there's no trees there. Is there anything like that? There's no, yeah, there's, there's not... trees on the Falklands. Oh, is there? Is there? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Well, natural or woodland or planted. Uh, I think it would be natural because it's not that it's no. actually the same 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 latitude or longitude or whatever as um, yeah. as the southern part of of, of Argentina. If you remember that yeah. very first slide I put on, it's actually level with the bottom of, of Argentina. Is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the places where you don't get any um, trees. I mean, the most I've been to the most southerly tree in the world, which is on. Oh, I think it's on Enderby Island. Enderby Island, down uh, or Campbell Island. I can't remember now. Um, off New Zealand. I mean, you know, halfway between New Zealand and Antarctica. Right, that is yeah. the most southerly tree. It's a Sitka spruce. Campbell Island, yeah, that's over there. Isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? I can't see any. Um, well, Keith, that was absolutely fantastic, as always. Um, Thank you. We are. We are blessed to have you so local to us to give us these excellent talks um from time to time uh always new always inspiring um and for those that do manage to get down there and follow in your footsteps i'm sure they'd be delighted to do so for those who are not able to get down there i can absolutely recommend reading some of shackleton's history Definitely. the journey he made to escape the wreckage of the south polar expedition and get up to um south georgia it was just an extraordinary journey um and well worth reading that history if you haven't done so previously 
Um, the other question that was asked earlier by Phil, um, the AGM coming up at the first week of April. Uh, we've got a guest speaker there, which will be an in-person speaker, obviously. It'll be an in-person meeting at Edmund Kell Hall, and it's going to be um, quite appropriate following tonight. Um, it's going to be on wildlife photography uh, by Diane Watkins, who uh, many of you will know. Um, uh, and so there'll be hopefully some tips on how we can all get up to key standards for capturing the wildlife we see around us. Um, so I think that's it. Um, if I can just finally thank Keith again, uh, thank all of you for attending. Um, I know we have one or two technical difficulties earlier with the link um, and with the for one or two people with the syncing of the presentation for some reason. Can't work out why that was, uh, but it will be up on our YouTube channel and I'll send a note round um, once I've done the subtitles and editing and stuff. So that'll be up on the YouTube channel in two or three days time. And so those of you who want to see it again or look at some of the photographs in more detail, you'll have that opportunity then. Uh, so in the meantime, thanks everyone for attending. We'll send a note round for the AGM and look forward to seeing as many of you as possible then. And from me, I thanks very much for being a great audience. Um, if anybody wants to help with those farm surveys, uh, do let me know. It's a very simple survey and not too far from Southampton. And um, see many of you, I hope, at the Hoss Members Day, which is on Saturday the 6th of April. Thanks very much indeed.